Hey, give these guys another hand. Yeah, that's great. Well, we got a lot of sound effect in here, haven't we? I'm glad to be here tonight. Thankful for all of you coming out on this Sunday evening, and I appreciate these guys singing for them. And I want to say something on their behalf. You guys did it exactly the way I told you to. I mean, you followed your instructions good, and I appreciate that. Uh, for, who, for you who do not know me, my name is Mickey Robinson. I'm the old pastor here in the church, and uh, I'm always glad when Pastor Knight gives me an opportunity to speak. And I'm especially glad tonight, because right down here we have Joe and Peggy. Uh, they were members of my church down in Mississippi. And uh, that was many, many years ago. And they've come up here to go to a convention up in Wauxahatchee. And so they come down to see me. And I'm just glad to have them. And I appreciate it. Now, I've got a sermon tonight. And I want to say something about my sermon. And that is the fact that if you don't like it, if you don't like it, you blame Brother Williams. Now, I know you're saying there's a bunch of Williams around this church. So who do we blame it on? Well, you blame it on the one that's going to the Philippines as a missionary because he preached on these same verses himself several months ago. And it really stirred me up, and I got involved with it, and God gave me a, a sermon that I'm calling Evidence. Evidence. And I think you'll see that in a few moments when we get into it. But before we do that, I want to make a confession. You know, they say confession is good for the soul, and this happened many, many months ago. It was on a Sunday night. Some of you will remember it. It's when Brother Knight was telling us how he was trying to get Stacy to marry him, and he had a plan. And I'm going to have to say something. His plan, it was outstanding. His plan was a fancy restaurant with valet parking. I mean, that was his plan. He knew she would have to say yes if he would take her to this uh, very fancy restaurant with that valet parking. Now, I was sitting right over there on the front row. I got under deep conviction. I mean, I, mean, I was really under conviction. And uh, I was miserable. And uh, I, j I didn't know what to do. I was squirming around on my chair. I, I was talking to myself, and uh, I heard uh, Sister uh, Johnson, that's the two right over there, uh, they were behind me, and she said to him, there's something wrong with Pastor Robinson. Something's wrong with him tonight. And he's squirming around. He's talking to himself. I believe he's having a stroke. And uh, Sammy said, now listen. That's the way he does all the time. So, you know, I guess I was okay. But anyway, as Brother Knight was going through his uh, little plan to get Stacy to marry him, I was getting more and more in conviction. And finally, just all at once, I said to myself, Lord, you know I never. And God said to me, Mickey, yes, you're right. You never took Peggy to a fancy restaurant that had valet parking. And I said, now God, now I can't, I'll never be. And he said, you're right again. Now that she's gone on to heaven, you'll never be able to take her to a fancy restaurant that has valet parking. And he said, but I'm going to tell you something, Mickey, because if I don't settle you down, you're going to mess up Pastor Knight's sermon. And so just listen to me. Where Peggy's at, everything, I mean, everything is better than a fancy restaurant and valet parking. And so I felt good after that. I settled down. He'd done his sermon. It was a good sermon, and we enjoyed it. So I just wanted to get that off my chest tonight, how it's good to have a, a confession. And uh, I feel better myself right now. I'm so glad to have you here tonight. My goodness gracious. As I said a moment ago, I'm calling this sermon evidence. Now, here's the thing that brought this to my mind. 
I heard years ago someone make the statement, if you were called into court and they wanted you to prove that you were a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Now, I'm going to tell you something. The church is filled with people that could not prove that they're a Christian because there's no evidence. Oh, they come to church now and then, usually Christmas and Easter, Mother's Day, you know, but really they don't live the life. They don't do the, they don't do the walk. They don't have the talk. They just don't have it. So if you had to prove tonight that you are a child of God, would there be enough evidence to prove that you are a Christian? We're going to get our Bible reading from the book of, of Luke chapter 19. And this is where our brother got his sermon that night. So if you'll listen to me, I'll read beginning in verse 1 of chapter 19. And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans. And he was rich, and he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the press, because he was little of statue. And he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him, and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he had gone to be a guest with a man that is a sinner. That's what they thought about him. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I've taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for so much as he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Now this is a very familiar story. I mean, I started preaching on this man years and years ago. And uh, I've heard other preachers preach on it. And it's just one of those stories that sort of stick with you and, and help you. And I hope and pray that I'll be able to give you something tonight that will help you in some way. Now, the best way to know somebody is to ask questions about them. You know that to be true. If you see somebody and you want to learn a little bit about them, you ask questions. And so that's how we're going to begin this sermon tonight. We're going to ask questions about Zacchaeus. And if I can give you some answers here, then you'll know more about this man when we leave in just a little while. And so first of all, I want to say, who was Zacchaeus? Well, first of all, we know that he was a Jew. We know that he worked for the Roman Empire and he was a IRS man. He worked for the Internal Revenue. He was a tax man. That was his occupation. That was his job. And the Bible tells us in these scriptures that we'll read in just a moment that he was very successful. He was very successful. Look in your Bible now and notice in these verses that this man, he was able to turn his life around from being a poor man and became very successful in his life. Notice also the Bible says that he was the chief among these tax people. That simply means he was the boss. He was over the other guys. They knew him. Everybody knew Zacchaeus because he was the one that ran the whole thing. He was important. He was the chief among the publicans. He was the other people's boss. Now, the Jew's name was very special. Most of us have gone through the Bible and we've looked up different individuals and their name has special meaning. Now, I wanted to make sure that I was right about this and I must admit that I was slightly off a little bit. Not a whole lot, but I was slightly off on this and I, I went to Brother Dice over here, Brother Gary, and I wanted him to fast check this and find out what does the word Zacchaeus mean? 
I mean, you know, Jewish people named their children after some, something they wanted for them to be very important, to be successful, and to be uh, good, and so on like that. And so the brother uh, Dice came back and told me that the word Zacchaeus means pure and clean. Pure and clean. Now, you can just imagine this man named Zacchaeus with that kind of name. And yet here he is, a tax collector. In fact, I read a verse there a while ago where they said when Jesus went home with him, they said he was going home to be a guest with a man that was a sinner, someone that was wicked and he had a name, that he was a sinner. And so we find here that the name that I used to use is the word peace. And so I don't know exactly where I got that name when I got it years ago, but I got to thinking about it. And so if you're pure and you're clean, what does that mean? That brings peace into your life. You'll never have peace in your life until you are pure and you're clean. And the only way you can have that is what these young men sung about. It takes the blood of Jesus to wash you white as snow and turn your life around. And so Zacchaeus, his name meant he had peace in his life. He was clean. He was pure. But he didn't have it. You know why? Because the Bible says he sought to see Jesus. That means he was troubled about something in his life. And he wanted to see this man called Jesus. Now, we know that he was a little man, a small man. And uh, the Bible says he was little of statue, little of statue. So I wanted to find out if there's anybody else small in the Bible. And so I went back to Brother Gary Dice, and I wanted him to fast check. Is there anybody in the Bible that was smaller than Zacchaeus? And so he came back and said, Brother Robinson, I'm not sure about this, but there is a rumor. There is a rumor that there was somebody that was smaller than Zacchaeus in the Bible. And he said, the rumor was that Peter was smaller than Zacchaeus. And I said, well, why did they say that? He said, because they said that Peter was so small that he slept on his watch. You folks can't, y'all pretty slow, aren't you? I see that tonight, I see that. But anyway, uh, Zacchaeus was a little man. Did you know that God favors little people? Now, I don't mean to upset all you tall people. I don't want to get you mad at me. But God favors little people. And I think that's outstanding because I'm sort of small myself. But I want to read you a scripture because some of you are doubting that the Bible says that God favors little people. So I want to read you this verse of scripture. Listen to it. You can look it up later. But in Matthew chapter 28 and verse 20, the Bible says, And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Did you hear that? And lo. In other words, small people have God's blessings on them. And I certainly uh, think that's a wonderful thing. Now, God does like tall people too. God likes John Wayne, amen. But everybody likes John Wayne. And, and so, you know, you, if you're tall, that's okay. But if you're short, don't put yourself down because you are special to God because they made a lot of us small people in the world. And so we are here tonight to recognize that God loves little people. Now, we know that somewhere in Zacchaeus' life, he had to make a decision. Like some of you, you have to make decisions all through your life. You made a decision about a mate. You made a decision about a job. You made a decision about where you'd go to live and everything like that. And so one day, Zacchaeus had to make a decision. And that decision was he was tired of being poor. He wanted money. And he made a decision to go to work for the Roman government and to become a tax collector. And boy, when he made that decision, that was a big cost to him. 
Because, you see, the Jewish people didn't like the tax collectors because they were thieves and they would cheat you. And Zacchaeus had to turn his back on his mama and his daddy and his Jewish faith and he had to turn his back on his people. And so he turned his back. He made the decision. He became a tax collector. And as I said a while ago, he became very rich and he became very successful in his job. And we know that for sure. Now, we know something one day caused this man to make a decision again. And we know that Zacchaeus heard something that changed his whole life. You know, the Bible says, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And we find, my friends, that Zacchaeus heard something from somebody somewhere that turned his life around and gave this man hope, hope. You heard the same thing one day. You were lost and undone and on your way to hell and you didn't know what to do. You were sad and you were defeated and you were convicted and you just didn't know what to do. But something came to you. You heard something. And that something was that there was a Savior in heaven that loved you and sent His Son to die on that old rugged cross that you might hear life. Now, I cannot prove this, but here's what I think he heard. Listen very carefully. It's found in the book of Matthew chapter 9 and verse 9. And as Jesus passed forth from hence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of customs. And he said unto him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. Can you imagine in your mind how that news, how they were talking about it in the office, everybody was re talking about that man, Matthew, he got up from his job and started following Jesus. And, and don't you know when Zacchaeus heard that news that Matthew, that tax collector, had made peace with God and is on his way to heaven now, don't you know he said, oh, good, maybe there's hope for me. Maybe there's hope for me. Oh, I tell you what, it encouraged him. Now, Matthew could have made peace with God right where Jesus found him. Remember where Jesus found Matthew, I mean Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus was up in that tree. And the Bible said that's where it said he was little of statue. He couldn't see over the crowd. And so he ran before and climbed up in that tree, and there he is, perched up on a limb in that tree. And guess who was coming down the road? None other than Jesus Christ. He was coming down the road, and Zacchaeus is up in the tree, and Jesus came right to that tree. He came to the place where Zacchaeus was. And remember what he did? He stopped right there. He stopped. Now, let me tell you something. All of us have a place to meet God. All of us. Many of our, us met God at a different place. Many of us. I met God on a Sunday morning at uh, the church in Fort Worth. Others have met God on the street corner. We saw many people saved on the north side of Fort Worth down on the streets. And we find in the Bible, remember there was a man named Saul. His name later became Paul. Where did he meet Jesus? His place was on the Damascus Road. Jesus met him on the Damascus Road. And Paul got saved, born again, came a child of God, wrote most of the New Testament. What a man of God he was. But he met Jesus on the road. Remember, there was another man that was sitting at the pool of Bethesda. He met Jesus by the pool, and Jesus healed him. There was another man that was sitting on the roadside, and Jesus was coming down the road, and he asked who, who that was coming because he was blind. And they said, it's Jesus of Nazareth. He began to call out, 
And so on the side of the road, a blind man met Jesus and got his sight back. You can go through the Bible, and there's many places where Jesus met somebody. You see, it could be right here tonight that you meet Jesus Christ. It doesn't have to be in a certain place. It doesn't have to be a pretty building like this. It doesn't have to be on the wayside or some other place. When you read the Bible, you find out that God has a place to meet every one of us. Every one of us. Oh, how good it is when you come to that place. So here we have Zacchaeus up in that tree. Jesus comes to the tree. And the Bible says that Jesus looked up and said, Zacchaeus, come down because I've got to go home with you. I must go home with you. Now, I've thought about that a lot in my life. I said, why didn't Jesus just say, come on down, Zacchaeus, I want to talk to you. And right there under that shade of that tree, he took Jesus into the, his uh uh, plan of salvation and showed him how he could be right with God that he was going to pay the price for man's sin on Calvary and everybody could have witnessed what happened but it didn't work that way Jesus said Zacchaeus come down for I must abide at thy home something was so important about Jesus going home with Zacchaeus and yet it didn't seem right it seemed like it would have blessed more people if Zacchaeus would have come down and they just sort of sat there under the tree and Jesus told him about how he had come from the Father and how he was going to die on Calvary and how he could be saved. But he didn't do that. In fact, the Bible says that Jesus went home with him. Went home with him. You'll notice in the scripture it talks about how Zacchaeus was joyful. And he came down and he was glad and he wanted, he was glad he was going to be with Jesus and everything. You see that in the Bible. Dear God, something happened when Jesus went home with Zacchaeus that changed everything. Changed everything. You know, people are very, well, sometimes people, if somebody got saved this way, they think everybody has to get saved the same way. I mean, I got saved by a swimming pool. I got saved by the side of the road. I got saved with a preacher sticking his head in my car window. I mean, people are like that. And so we find that Zacchaeus takes Jesus to his house, and when he gets to his house, Jesus goes inside the house, and you don't see nothing. You don't see a thing. But remember, our message tonight is about evidence, evidence, because whatever happened inside that house is going to give evidence that Zacchaeus has made peace with God. And so in a little while, we find Zacchaeus comes out of the house, and Zacchaeus make his, makes one of the greatest statements you'll ever read in your Bible. And I want you to look at that, if you will. Here's what he said. Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And now I've taken anything from any man by false accusation. I restore him fourfold. Question, does that sound like the man at the beginning of this chapter 19 in Luke that turned his back on God, turned his back on his mom and dad, turned his back on his Jewish faith, and sold out to the Roman government to be a tax collector and make money. Does that sound like the same man? So whatever happened inside of that house changed this man. Whatever happened changed his whole life, his whole life. He said, Lord, behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. Oh, I tell you what, I see a new man. Isn't that what happened to you when you got saved? Do you remember what you were? Oh, you don't like to talk about yourself. Oh, I wasn't that bad preacher. I wasn't that bad. Let me tell you how bad you was. You was going to hell. That's how bad you were. You were lost. You were undone. 
You did wrong things. You said wrong things. You cursed. You used profanity. You lied. You did all kinds of things. You were ungodly. Oh, preacher, I wasn't so bad. Let me tell you, you were bad. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. If you would have died the way you used to be, you would have went to hell. But something happened. You met Jesus, and that person that you were got changed by the grace of God. You got saved by the mercy of God. You got born again. Remember, Jesus said, I must. You know what the word must in the Bible? That's an imperative word. It means it has to go. Jesus said to Zacchaeus, I've got to go home with you. Remember what Jesus said to Nicodemus in John chapter 3? Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. That's an imperative. You cannot go to heaven unless you get saved. And when you get saved, there's going to be evidence of it. There's going to be the witness of it. And here's the witness. When Zacchaeus stepped out of his house and looked at the people, he said, Lord, money's not my God anymore. Money's not my God. God, I'll give money away. I'll bless people. If I cheated people, I'll make it right. That's the evidence. Because Zacchaeus was a changed man. A changed man. I got saved on a Sunday morning many, many years ago. And I've never stopped going to church. I've never stopped reading my Bible. I've never stopped being a preacher. You know why? Because God changed me. God changed me that day. I wasn't a bad person like some people might be. I, was, I never did some things that some people do. But I was still lost. I was still undone and everything. Remember what the Bible says, and I think the pastor used this verse this morning in his service. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, the only way you get in Christ is getting saved. You don't get saved by joining Victory Baptist Church. You don't get saved by going into a baptistry. You don't get saved by putting money in an offering plate. The only way you get saved is by putting your faith and trust in Jesus, confessing your sins, being born again, and your whole life changes. Your whole life changes. Oh, I tell you what. The Bible tells us, there, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, a new creature. That word creature also means a new creation. When you got saved, you became somebody new, somebody new. I'm going to say something. You may not like it. You may get mad at me, but I'm going to tell you something. Tonight, if you say you're born again, then you're different. If you're not different, you're a liar. If you're not different, then you're not telling the truth. Because when Zacchaeus got saved, his whole life changed. Money was not his God anymore. Money was not what he lived for. Something happened to him in that house that changed his whole life. And some of you know what I'm talking about. Some of you know what I'm talking about. There's a verse, listen to this verse, in 1 John chapter 1 Verse 29, if you know that he is righteous, that's referring to Jesus, if you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. That little word doeth there means practice. So what does a Christian do? They practice righteousness. They practice righteousness. And you know that's not true with everybody. Something's wrong. There are some people, they don't practice righteous. You do because you know that God changed you and you know you have a desire to please God and do what's right. So God's people practice righteousness. I hope you can hear that. 
Now, we know what the devil's children do. The devil's children, they play around. They have a good time in sin. They live it up. They live anywhere they want to. They shack up. They, they just do anything they want to. They don't go to church. And if they do go to church, they don't listen. So we find that the devil's kids do sinful things. God's kids do righteous things. Amen. The last part of 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17 reads like this. Old things are passed away. And behold, all things have become new. My, I'm so glad what God did that day in Fort Worth. When I walked down the aisle in that little Baptist church, I didn't understand it. I didn't comprehend it completely. But you know, God did something that has now lasted for years and years. God made me different, different. And he's made some of you different. You're not who you used to be. You love the Lord now. You go to church. You love the Bible. You love good things. You love the wonderful things of God because you're a Christian now, and that's great. I want to give you something here, and after we get this, we can go home. Uh, people will see your evidence. Now, did you get what I said? People will see your evidence. You can only fool people for a while. You eventually, you're going to say something, do something, go somewhere, and people are going to see you, and they're going to know the truth. So people will see your evidence just as they saw the evidence in Zacchaeus. They knew what Zacchaeus was before he got down out of that tree. And they knew that when Zacchaeus came out of that house and when he made the statement, I'll give my money away, they knew something happened to him. Something happened to him. He was different now. The evidence is there. We see it. Money was not his God anymore. In the book of John chapter 13 and verse 35, this verse is very important. Listen very carefully now, if you will. By this, can I say that again? By this, by this, all men shall know that you are my disciples. Why? Because you love one another. All of us have met people who claim to be saved, but they were as mean as a junkyard dog. They didn't have love for people. They weren't concerned about people that were hurting. They weren't concerned about people that had needs in their life. But my friends, when you get saved, you're going to love people. People. I'm not talking about the difference in people. I'm talking about you'll love people. It don't matter who they are, where they're from. You'll love people because the Bible says, if you are my disciples, you will love one another. So what is the evidence? The evidence is, do you love people? Do you love the poor? Do you love the hurting do you love the sick? Do you love others that don't have what you have? Do you love people? That's the evidence. The evidence will come out in your life, how you treat people, if you're kind and if you're good and if you show mercy and you reach down to people. I received some criticism one time in my life and you know, you don't like to be criticized, but I was pastoring in Yakima, Washington. I, I go down to the rescue mission every few weeks and preach. And some of my men went down with me one night, and a, a drunk came down to the front. And I went down beside him, put my arms around him, and said, can I help you, sir? He started crying. He said, you don't know me, but I used to be a very important person. I had money. I had a wife. I had children. If 
But I started drinking, and I lost it all. He said, now I have nothing. I said, I'm sorry, sir. I know you feel bad, but can I tell you about a man that can help you? Can I tell you about Jesus? And there on that altar that night, with my arm around him, just a hobo on the street, I told him about Jesus. And he prayed the sinner's prayer. And he looked into my eyes. I'll never forget what he did. He looked into my eyes and he said, Preacher, it works. It works, preacher. I want to tell you it does work. If you'll put your trust in Jesus, he'll save you. And the evidence will be you'll love people. You'll love people. You'll want to see people saved. You'll want to see the church blessed. You'll pray for the preacher. You'll, you will love the things of God. And so I'm so glad that we have this illustration in the Bible of Zacchaeus, who was a man that loved money. But when he got saved, money no longer was his God. Now he loved people. And he wanted to bless people. And he wanted to help people. I'm going to give you some words of wisdom. Some words of wisdom. Now listen very carefully. It'll sound not so profound. But it's very important. When you love. Now get me now. Everybody up in this building. When you love. You are like God. Did you know that? Think about it. You can be like God. You can be like God. You can walk up to somebody that's hurting, someone that's sad and defeated and downhearted. You can put your arm around them and say, God loves you, and I love you too, and you're like God. If, do you want to be like some famous basketball star? Would you like to be some quarterback on one of the big teams? Would you like to be some famous lawyer? No, not me. You know who I want to be like? I want to be like God. And so if I will practice love, if I will demonstrate love and share love with other people, then I am like God. Amen. Bow your heads with me, if you will, for just a moment. I want to pray with you, and then we'll turn the service over to the preacher and make him take charge of it. I want to pray with you tonight. Father, Father, I want to thank you. I realize I'm an old man. I don't think as quick and I'm not as active as I used to be. And I know it probably won't be too long till I'll be stepping over that line and I'll be waking up in that wonderful place called heaven. But God, as long as I'm here, help me to be kind. God, help me to be the kind of a person that reaches out to others and tries to help them. God, let me take what little I might have and share it with others. God, you've been so good to me. God, I know I don't deserve what you've done in my life. But God, I'm so glad that when I read this story about Zacchaeus, I see that the evidence of salvation is the heart that has been changed and the vision that is given to the individual. God, I want you to bless these people here tonight. God, bless this group of singers. God, they're so talented. God, they do a great job. God, we have a great pastor. He does a great job. God, we know he loves people. We see it in his life. We see it demonstrated. 
And God, we're so glad. God, many a Sunday I come down here to the church and God, I might be a little down, but I meet these fine people and God, they cheer me up. They make me want to keep going on. And God, I just pray that for the rest of my life and the rest of the life of these people here in this auditorium, that God, we will give the evidence that we have experienced the new birth. God, let us be a witness. Let us be the kind of people that you want us to be. God, give us the grace that we need to stand up and be counted in these days that we're in. Our nation is in a mess tonight. God, things don't look good, but God, we have a great God that cares about us. And God, if we're your children, you want us to demonstrate your heart to this world. Thank you for these people. God, you know everyone in this building tonight. You know those that are downhearted. You know those that need strength. You know those that need encouragement. God, minister to them. Minister to them as only you can. We thank you for all the things that you do in our life each day. I'm glad to have Joe and Peggy here with me. And Father, I'm glad to be amongst these people here at Victory Baptist Church. God, make this church a testimony in this community. God, let us lift up the blood-stained banner. And God, let us tell this world that they can be different when Jesus comes into their heart. Bless us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with us? Pastor, would you come up?